The History Network .org podcast, Season 17, Episode 7, The Battle of Arras. The Battle of Arras was in fact a series of battles in April, May 1917, including Vimy Ridge. The Battle of Arras has gone down in history as being an Allied victory, but which in reality saw little gain in terms of Allied advance and huge casualty figures on both sides after its 39-day duration. In fact, such was the attrition rate that for the Allies it surpassed the Somme in terms of daily casualty toll, include the German casualties and an average of some 7,500 casualties a day occurred throughout. As was often the case in the Great War, the intentions of the battle planners and commanders were, if not noble and lofty, greatly ambitious. But the results often bore out somewhat differently than the intent, and although the Battle of Arras was no exception, there were some notable gains in the initial stages of a magnitude as yet to be witnessed in the war thus far. The intended aim of the battle was to end the war in just 48 hours, and its plans were conceived in conjunction with the French High Command, who were planning a massive assault themselves, some 80 kilometres to the south of Arras along the River N, named the Nivelle Offensive, after the French commanding officer at the time, Robert-Georges Nivelle. It's unsurprising in a way that the intentions were ambitious, following the previous year's huge losses at the Somme and Verdun, there was public pressure, particularly in France, to bring the war to an end quickly. Elsewhere, the ramifications of 1916 were seeing political change in Britain, as well as the US making more serious noises about entering the fray. Originally, Arras had been planned as an early offensive in 1917, around February time, but there were several factors which meant it was rescheduled to April-May instead. Firstly, Russia had indicated that it would not be able to assist in a February plan, and this would have meant, rather than a two-pronged attack, a single French assault only would have been possible along the N. In late 1916, Russia was in disarray on the Eastern Front, a series of crushing defeats, and it has to be said bruising casualty figures even when they had any successes, and ceding 200 miles to Austria-Hungary, not to mention casualties approaching the one million mark, had left civilian patriotism at an all-time low. Come 1917, some Russian army units began to disobey orders. Such was the demoralisation within the Russian army's officer corps, brought on by the poor progress of the fighting, and again the depressing scale of the loss of life. The Tsar would abdicate his throne in March, the Imperial Russian army would subsequently disintegrate as open civil war swept across Russia. The French would get no help from the east for the Nivelle offensive. Secondly, through Operation Alberich, the German army had retreated to the Hindenburg line, disrupting the tactical assumptions underlying the plans for the French offensive. When French plans were originated, they not surprisingly assumed that the status quo of front lines would be much unaltered when they planned to attack in early 1917. But with the German army now at the Hindenburg line, large parts of the original plans were now useless. In fact, when they eventually advanced to compensate during the Battle of Arras, the French encountered no German troops whatsoever in the original planned assault sector. So, given both the political and battlefield shifts happening at the time, it was initially uncertain whether the offensive would go ahead at all. The British wanted to err on the side of caution in these shifting sands. The French wanted a quick battle and glorious victory to quell civil unrest at home. The French remained convinced that their assault along the Aisne could succeed if the British assisted with a diversionary offensive in the Arras sector. On the 16th of January 1917, just this plan was agreed at the London Convention of the same date. The British would make a diversionary assault in the Arras sector one week prior to the French attack. Mid-April was chosen as the start date for the action. The British-led attack would be made up of forces from the United Kingdom, Australia, Newfoundland, 
Canada and New Zealand. It would be a battle in two distinct phases, in between which was a short hiatus. Douglas Haig, Edmund Allenby, Henry Horn and Hubert Goff commanded the Allied forces. Erich Ludendorff, Ludwig von Falkenhausen and Gorg von der Marwitz commanded the German forces. The first phase was initiated with two simultaneous actions, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, 9th to 12th of April, and the First Battle of the Scarp, which took place from the 9th to the 14th of April. The land lies pretty flat around Arras, a part that is to the north, where the land rises up to form Vimy Ridge, long held by the Germans and dominating the surrounding countryside. Integral to an Allied success would be the taking of Vimy Ridge, but that alone would not be enough to secure victory. This opening phase of the conflict is considered to have been a great success for the British and Allied forces. Vimy had already seen much action. In May 1915, the French 10th Army had attempted to oust the Germans from the region during the Second Battle of Artois by attacking Vimy Ridge and Notre-Dame-de-Lorette. The French held it briefly, but without any reinforcements, lost it again. In September 1915, the French tried again, but could only capture the local town of Suchet. In all, the French had suffered approximately 150,000 casualties in their attempts thus far to gain control of Vimy Ridge and its surrounding territory. Also, prior to the Battle of Arras, the region had seen much Allied preparation, particularly in terms of mining and tunnelling. The region of Arras is chalky and therefore easily excavated. So, from 1916, the Royal Engineers had been tasked to construct troop tunnels and sought to connect and add their new tunnels to a vast subterranean network of tunnels and galleries which ran under Arras itself, all in the hope of getting troops as close to the front line as possible, at minimum risk of discovery. The scale of the Allied tunnel building was huge. In just one sector, four tunnel companies, comprising 500 men each, worked 24 hours a day in 18-hour shifts for two months. Mostly made up of New Zealanders, including Maori and Pacific Islanders from the New Zealand Pioneer Battalion, and Bantams from North English mining towns, these men constructed 20 kilometres of tunnels which could take a variety of traffic from foot soldiers all the way up to a light railway system. Just before the assault, the tunnel network had grown to such a size that it could conceal 24,000 men with full electric lighting from its own generators, as well as kitchens, latrines and a medical centre with a fully equipped operating theatre. Of course, the Germans were also tunnelling and mining as well, and the New Zealand tunnellers suffered 41 deaths, and 151 wounded as a result of the Germans' below-ground countermeasures. By the way, if you're interested in seeing what these tunnels were like, a 250-metre portion of the Grange subway at Vimy Ridge is open to the public from May to November, and the Wellington Tunnel was open to the public as the Carrier Wellington Museum in March 2008. When the Battle of Vimy Ridge commenced on 9th of April, its main combatants were four divisions of Canadians who were facing three divisions of German troops. Meticulous planning, well-trained forces and an initial well-targeted and relentless artillery bombardment by the Allies saw the Canadians capture a large part of the ridge on the first day. In fact, so successful was their initial attack that they advanced some three and a half miles the furthest achieved in the West since trench warfare had begun in 1914. Simultaneously, the First Battle of the Scarp saw the 12th Division attacking Observation Ridge, north of Arras. Having reached this, they pushed on to Fushi, as well as the second and third lines of German trenches, the ultimate objective being Monkeyriegel, a trench running between Wancourt and Fushi, and an important component of the German defences. Much of the objective had been reached by April the 10th, and a few days later, the Monkey Regal was in British hands. If Vimy and the First Battle of the Scarp had produced success, then the final part of the first phase of Arras, the First Battle of Bullecourt, was the opposite. Allied forces of the British 62nd Division, together with the Australian 4th Division, 
were to form a flanking attack on the village of Bullecourt, a stronghold of the Germans. Bad weather had delayed tanks needed for an assault on 10th of April, so the action was rescheduled for the following day. However, not all troops received the rescheduling news, and so two battalions of the West Yorkshire Regiment, still on the 10th of April, attacked on their own, but were driven back with withering losses. Not only was there heavy loss of life with that first attack, but it also had the effect of alerting the Germans to the Allies and allowed them to reinforce in readiness for another assault. But the second assault began with a lacklustre Allied artillery bombardment, which left most of the barbed wire still intact, and then, with only 11 tanks being available, meant that some initial advances by the Allies resulted in an inevitable withdrawal, and the whole action cost a great many lives once more. The newspapers at the time on both sides gave their views to their readers. In London, the Times commented, The great value of our recent advance here lies in the fact that we have everywhere driven the enemy from high ground and robbed him of observation. Having secured these high seats, Vimy, Monchy and Croisai, and enthroned ourselves, it is not necessarily easy to continue the rapid advance. An attack down the forward slope of high ground exposed to the fire of lesser slopes beyond is often extremely difficult, and now on the general front there must intervene a laborious period with which we were familiar at the Somme of systemic hammering and storming of individual positions, no one of which can be attacked until some covering one has been captured. The Berlin Daily Vossisch Zeitung wrote, We have to count on reverses like that near Arras. Such events are a kind of tactical reverse. If this tactical reverse is not followed by strategical effects, i.e., breaking through on the part of the aggressor, then the whole battle is nothing but a weakening of the attack party in men and material. The Frankfurter Zeitung commented, If the British succeed in breaking through, it will render conditions worse for them, as it will result in freedom of operations, which is Germany's own special art of war. The second phase of the attack was meant to see the Allies break through simultaneously with the French at Ing as well as consolidate the advances and gains from the first phase. However, it was pretty obvious from day one of Nivelle's offensive on the 16th of April that this action was failing and Haig was under pressure to keep the Germans occupied in the Arras region to try and minimise French casualties. Phase two began four days after the First Battle of Bullecourt. On the 15th of April, it was the Germans who took the initiative this time, attacking the Australian 1st Division at Longnicourt. After German High Command had seen fit to send extra forces to General Otto von Moser after seeing his plans for the attack, von Moser was able to attack the Australians with 23 battalions from four divisions and managed to penetrate and occupy Longnicourt. In the end, the Australians fought back and regained the village, meaning nothing had really changed, except, of course, for the 3,323 casualties suffered on both sides to keep the status quo. This was the general story for much of the other battles and re-engagements of the second phase. The Second Battle of the Scarp on April 23rd and 24th saw small initial advances by the Allies, again with heavy casualties, but then stalemate ensued. Some probable large casualties were no doubt avoided when the British commanders called off the action on the 24th of April in the face of stiff German resistance. The Battle of Alleux on the 28th and 29th of April resulted in heavy casualties once again through attack and counter-attack, but ultimately it did at least secure the Canadian position on Vimy Ridge. Through securing this area, the British commanders fancied their chances at a two-pronged attack with the Australians. While the British would launch an attack in the Third Battle of the Scarp, the Australians would launch a simultaneous attack in the Second Battle of Bullecourt. The British offensive at Scarp, starting on the 3rd of May, was short-lived as neither prong made any significant advances, but once again incurred heavy casualties. It was these casualties that caused the British to halt their attack the next day on the 4th of May. German resistance for the Australians was fierce at Bullecourt, and when the offensive was called off on the 17th of May, few of the initial objectives had been met. 
the Australians were in possession of much of the German trench system between Bullecourt and Rioncourt les Cagnicourt, but had been unable to capture Andecourt. British troops managed to push the Germans out of Bullecourt, but incurred considerable losses, failing also to advance northeast to Andecourt. With the end of the Second Battle of Bullecourt came the end of the Battle of Arras. The battle is seen as a victory for the Allies largely because of the taking of Vimy Ridge, but little strategic advantage was really achieved. Despite the early and impressive advances, these weren't built upon, and by the end of the action, little ground had been gained and staggering losses had been incurred on both sides. Following the fighting, the Germans built further defences and a stalemate resumed. The British did learn important lessons around the deployment of artillery, troops and tanks, lessons they would use to effect in the fighting of 1918. Vimy Ridge is perhaps the most famous of the battles which took place as part of the Battle of Arras. Particularly for Canadians, the Battle of Vimy Ridge has considerable significance. Indeed, Canadian historian John Pierce has noted, the historical reality of the battle has been reworked and reinterpreted in a conscious attempt to give purpose and meaning to an event that came to symbolise Canada's coming of age as a nation. The Canadian National Vimy Memorial on the highest point of the Vimy Ridge uses a 100 hectare or 250 acre portion of the former battlefield to preserve part of the memorial park that surrounds the monument. The grounds of the site are still honeycombed with wartime tunnels, trenches, craters and unexploded munitions and are largely closed off for public safety. Outside of Canada, Vimy Ridge has much less significance and is simply noted as being one part of the larger offensive of the Battle of Arras. As with much of the Great War, the Battle of Arras saw depressingly large casualty figures. The Allies suffered just under 159,000 casualties in just 39 days, a rate of over 4,000 a day, the worst daily casualty rate of the war, with 25 Victoria Crosses being awarded. By comparison, the Somme was an attrition rate of just under 3,000 a day, although of course the Somme went on much longer and therefore the total casualties were higher. For the Germans at the Battle of Arras, it was casualties close to the Allied total, but the figures are a little less sure and complete on the German side. One Canadian recipient of the Victoria Cross at Vimy was Private John George Patterson. He hadn't enlisted with the Canadian Expeditionary Force until he was 40, and at Vimy found himself fighting with the 50th Infantry Battalion. His citation in the London Gazette reads... For most conspicuous bravery in attack, when the advance of our troops was held up by an enemy machine gun which was inflicting severe casualties, Private Patterson, with utter disregard of his own safety, sprang forward and, jumping from shell hole to shell hole, reached cover within thirty yards of the enemy gun. From this point, in face of heavy fire, he hurled bombs, killing and wounding some of the crew then rushed forward, overcoming and bayoneting the surviving five gunners. His valour and initiative undoubtedly saved the situation and made possible the further advance to the objective. Private Patterson was killed in a later attack on June the 3rd. Patterson Bridge in Calgary, Alberta, and one of the peaks in Alberta's Jasper National Park are named in his honour. Perhaps the huge effort and cost in lives going almost nowhere that was the Battle of Arras is best summed up by Ludendorff, who sometime after the battle commented, No doubt exceedingly important strategic objects lay behind the British attack, but I have never been able to discover what they were. Just as a footnote, I recently went to the Faubourg Damien Cemetery and the Arras Memorial in Arras. The Arras Memorial there commemorates around 35,000 servicemen from the United Kingdom, South Africa and New Zealand who died in the Arras sector between the spring of 1916 and August 1918 and who have no known grave. The most conspicuous events of this period being the subject of this podcast and the German attack in the spring of 1918. Canadian and Australian servicemen killed in these operations are commemorated by memorials at Vimy and Villers-Bretonneux.
a separate memorial remembers those killed in the Battle of Cambrai in 1917. When I visited, I was the only person there, and it was a sobering place to stand and reflect. If you ever get the chance to go, then I do recommend it. There are several ways you can help support the History Network via the donate button at the website, by purchasing older seasons from the store for just £2 each, by liking our Facebook page, or by following us on Twitter. We are at History Network on there. By writing a podcast script for us, or by suggesting subjects we can cover, and even just by dropping us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org, and letting us know you're out there. Any and all of it is greatly appreciated and welcome. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to The History Network, written and read by Nick Barker. Bye.